folks. Let's all stand, do a few jumping jacks, and get awake here. All right. <laughs> We're glad you're back with us this afternoon as we have another opportunity to worship God. But before we do that, just a few uh, reminders, a few announcements. Uh, Judy Dickert's, uh, Dickerman, uh, as far as we know, is undergoing surgery about right now. Uh, we tried to contact Ken. Uh, we have no updates for you, so just want to keep her in our prayers. Uh, like I said, Bob Burkert had surgery Friday, did real well, was here this morning. Uh, Doris Shepard uh, underwent a knee replacement surgery last week, and I think she is in a rehab facility. So want to remember these folks in our prayers as well as others we may be unaware of. Let's remember them in our prayers not only today but throughout this week. Also, tomorrow night will be Monday night for the Master. There are sign-up sheets located on the table next to the Elders Conference Room. Uh, graduating seniors, please get a copy of the senior profile sheet from Dustin or Chris and fill those out and return to the office by April 30th. Uh, an important announcement for the kiddos, Kids Sing will begin again next week, so we know you're going to be excited about that. And I think that is it. Everything else you'll find in your bulletin, we encourage you to uh, read the overhead, get a copy of the bulletin, read it online. A lot of, lot of activities going on. Uh, so just take a look at that when you can. If you bow your heads, we'll go to Heavenly Father in prayer and we'll begin our worship service. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this another opportunity to worship. And we just pray you be with us as we do that, that we might please you and honor you, Father. We thank you for our worship this morning and just... Pray that it was acceptable. Father, we thank you for the ones that were here this morning and back this afternoon. We're, we're always thankful for the faithful. And Father, we just pray that you help us to do all we can to encourage the, the weaker brethren, the ones that were not here today because of uh, other activities or functions. Uh, just pray you help us to encourage them and uh, do all we can to, uh, to be an example for them. Father, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be here and worship you and do so with the freedom that we have and just pray you continue to bless us in that way. And Father, for all other things, we know you're the giver of all that's good and we thank you for each good and marvelous gift, Father, but especially we thank you for the gift of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. And it's through his name we offer this prayer. Amen. <clears throat> It is so great to be here today. <clears throat> Let's rejoice in the Lord. We'll sing Philippians 4.4 4 to open us up. Okay? Rejoice in the Lord always. <coughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, 
I serve the risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is in whatever he may say. I see the hand of mercy, I hear the voice of cheer. And just as I am here, he's always here. He lives, he lives, and Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, and I wish to live more. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of His appearing will come at last. He lives, He lives, and Jesus lives today. He walks with me and comes with me along the narrow way. He lives, He lives, and I wish to. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace. We thank thee, O Lord, for allowing us to live to see another beautiful Lord's day, in which we may be able to come together once more and worship you in the spirit and truth, for you are worthy of all praise and worship. We thank thee, O God, for the health which we enjoy. We pray, O God, that you would please be with those who are mentioned that were in need of prayer, those who, who are sick, those that are shut in, we pray that you would please be with them and please help them to get better. We thank thee, O Lord, for always being with us throughout life's journeys. We thank thee, O God, for all your blessings, for the spiritual blessings of which we enjoy through, through Christ Jesus. We thank thee, O Lord, for loving us enough to send your son to die for us so that we may have the hope of eternal life. We pray, O oh God, that you would please be with us throughout the rest of this day and throughout the rest of our lives as we strive to be faithful to thee so that we may get to heaven and spend eternity with you. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray and give thanks to thee. Amen. How shall the young secure their hearts? Let's stand as we sing this. <laughs> How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? I heard the choicest rules in far to keep the conscience
afternoon's scripture readings from 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 through 12. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with ever and heat. Both the earth and the works that are, are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in the holy conduct and, and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with ever and heat. I think it's on. All right. Appreciate you being back with us this afternoon. Uh, for the last three months on Sunday evenings, I have uh, taught the same lesson uh, every week, and I thought about doing an encore tonight of that, <laughs> but you didn't ask for an encore, and I think you have to ask for an encore for there to be an encore, so there's not going to be an encore tonight, um, but uh, it was good. We enjoyed um, doing the, the CIA, CIA uh, over the last few months, but we are back to our, our normally scheduled uh, programming, and so we are here today, and we appreciate you being with us. I do, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I do have a little clock up here that I try to keep, because I try to keep track of, you know, how long I'm up here, lest the night turn to day and day turn to night and all that kind of stuff, but this morning, it wasn't really working well. It said 710 when I got up here, 710. I thought, well, it's, that's not right, but I can, I can roll with that, right, because I can, I can add and I can, you know, I can do all that. And I'd been going for a while, and I just happened to look down, and it still said 710, and I thought, they're in trouble, because I don't know what time it is, and I'm, yeah. it all worked out, I think, but uh, I have fixed it, because it says 145 now, uh, and it should be working. This morning, we did a lesson, and we looked a little bit, and, and being kind of a fundamental Sunday, we looked at the idea of what John talks about in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, about knowing that we can have eternal life, and so I tried to make this uh, clear this morning, but I want to kind of reiterate this with our lesson this afternoon. Now, when we look at that passage, and we notice together that, uh, that the Bible tells us that we can know that, and we look at God pro God's promises, and we know God's love, and we see that He sent His Son to die for us, we know that He is a God that is, that is forgiving, and we know that He will forgive us of our sins, and so we can have assurance of eternal life. But that doesn't mean that we can just kind of live our life however we want to live. In fact, uh, there is still a standard that has been set by which we must we must render our lives to, we, we must submit our lives to, and, and live our lives by that standard. And so this afternoon, I, this lesson that, that I want to do this afternoon really kind of spins off of that lesson this morning, but I want to take a look at some words that Peter mentions there in 2 Peter chapter 3. And so if you've got your Bibles, I know it was just read, but we're going to look at it again, and so you might want to turn over there to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to, in the context, think about what Peter is talking about here. Just a little bit earlier within that chapter, Peter talks about uh, what he refers to as scoffers. In other words, there are those who, are, who, will, who will doubt God's Word. You know, we talked this morning about the idea of faith and what faith is, and faith is really a wholehearted trust in God, right? That you, that you put your trust in God. So if God says that He's going to do something, or if God says something's going to happen, you believe it. You trust that that's what's going to take place. You trust that that is what is going to happen. Well, Jesus had talked about coming again. His second coming, and we know that. We've talked about that ourselves, and we, we look forward to that day. Well, during this particular time, there were those who were mentioned by Peter as being scoffers, those who, who doubted the second coming of Christ. And they used that as, as ammunition against Christians. They used that to try to, to create doubt in their minds. Now, I will say this to you, that the idea of creating doubt is as old as really uh, the, the, the world that we live in. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. 
And you can look at uh, the interaction between Eve and Satan. And if you notice one of the things that Satan tries to do in the very beginning, in the very first temptation with mankind, is that he does his best to create doubt, doesn't he? Did God really say that you would die if you ate of that particular tree? Is that really what God said? Think about it. And so Satan is trying his best to, to create doubt. And even in this particular time in which Peter writes these things, there were those individuals who were trying to create doubt in the minds of Christians. Again, what we talked about this morning. There is doubt sometimes that creeps into our mind. Does God really mean what He says? Is God really going to do all the things that He said that He was going to do? Will God really forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness if I confess those things to Him? And so there were those scoffers. There were those who were trying to create doubt in the minds of Christians. Where is this coming of the Lord that you talk about? You talk about the, the Lord coming back again, but, but we haven't seen Him. You know, you talk about this over and over again, and, and since the Lord left this earth, well, He hasn't come back yet. And, and why is that? And so He talks about those individuals, and, and He wants to address that with these Christians because He doesn't want that doubt to creep into their mind to where they don't believe God and what God was saying. So notice what He says uh, on account of that, and this is in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, look at, notice verse, uh, verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise. In other words, if God makes a promise, He's going to keep it. Now, have you ever had somebody who made a promise to you where they said they're going to do something, and when you ask them about it, uh, you think in your mind they're probably not going to do it. They said they're going to do, and they make excuses. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I promise. I, I just have to I have to wait until this happens, or I have to wait until that happens, or you know, it's going to be next week, or it'll be next month. And they continue to do that, and they continue to put you off to the point where you feel like they're just not going to do what they said they're going to do. I might as well not even count on this, right? Well, we we think about that, but that's not the case with God, and that's what Peter is saying here. The Lord is not slow. In other words, God is not, not, not waiting around. He's not him hawing around thinking, well, I, I just need to delay this because I'm not really going to do what I said I'm going to do. So I'll just kind of keep putting this off, putting this off, putting this off because I'm never going to do what I intend to do. That's not who God is. As we talked about this morning, God is the kind of God that he, if he says he's going to do something, if he makes a promise, he's going to keep that promise. God cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. And so Peter says that's not what God is doing. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but here's what's going on, he says. But is patient towards you. Some versions say long-suffering towards you. We talked about this morning the, the long-suffering of God. That's who God is, right? God is, is a long-suffering God. He is a patient God. He's not a God who, again, has us dangling over the fires of hell, just waiting for us to make a mistake so that he can condemn us for all of eternity. God is patient with mankind. He is long-suffering. Now, Peter, in the previous epistle, 1 Peter, in the same chapter, chapter 3, he talked about the long-suffering of God in the days of Noah. Here he recounts God's long-suffering again, and he says this about that. He says, but is patient or long-suffering toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Here is why Jesus has not come back yet. It's not because God is not going to keep his promise. It's not because God is, is slow to keep his promises. In other words, yeah, he eventually does it, but boy, it takes him a while. No, no, the reason why that has not happened yet is because God is long-suffering towards you. He is patient towards you because he is not willing that any should perish. Why do you think, now, if God, you go back to the days of Noah, if God had wanted to, could God have made the boat for Noah? He could have, right? And if God had made the boat for Noah, how long do you think it would have taken God to make that boat? Well, let's think about it in these terms, right? How long did it take God to create the world and everything in it? Six days, right? So if God can create everything in this world in six days, how long do you think it would take God to, to make a boat? Well, I mean, probably literally a matter of minutes or seconds, right? So we're talking very fast. God could have made the boat. I said, all right, Noah, get in there, you and the animals. And literally within an hour's time, the rains could have been falling, uh, falling on the earth, the, the, the floods opened uh, from the earth, and all of mankind would have been destroyed. But that's not what God did. Now, part of that was for Noah, for his obedience, right, to test Noah, but also because God, again, was long-suffering. God literally was giving man on earth at that particular time time to listen to the message that Noah would preach 
and to repent. You ever wondered why the ark was so big? People say, well, that's because of all the animals. Well, perhaps so, but also think about this. Could potentially God have created the ark to be that big because maybe perhaps there may have been some who might have, you know, answered to the preaching of, I and mean, responded to the preaching of Noah in a positive way? And maybe God was creating enough room for that to potentially or possibly happen. But nevertheless, God was certainly patient, wasn't he? And it took Noah about 100 years to build that ark. And so God, while the earth was so terrible and horrible, and all the people were only thinking about and dwelling on, on evil continuously in their mind, God was patient with them. And he gave them extra time to try to, to give them the opportunity to get it right. That's exactly what God is doing now. And so it's not that God is slow concerning his promises, but rather God is long-suffering. He is patient. He is not willing for any to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. But then he goes into this, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, it is going to happen. God is going to keep his promise. And when it comes, you're not going to know when it comes. It will come like a thief. It will come in an hour and a time in which you do not expect. That came directly from our Lord, did it not? Peter would have heard those very words. And he says, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be discovered. Now watch verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way. In other words, not only is it to happen, but you and I should believe it's going to happen because God said it was going to happen. We, we trust him, right? Since all of that is going to happen, right? Then he says this. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You see, according to Peter, it matters how we live our life, right? Knowing that this is going to happen, knowing that God said it was going to happen, knowing that you don't know when it's going to happen, but you know it's going to happen, knowing that God made a promise, that you know he's going to keep his promises, knowing all of those things, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, knowing that it's imminent, that God is going to return again. And knowing what God is going to do and what that's going to mean, how should we live our lives? See, if it doesn't matter how we live our lives, then Peter would say, don't worry about it. You just live how you want to live, eat, drink, be merry, enjoy your life, and don't worry about a thing. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, knowing that this is going to happen, what manner of person ought you to be? What kind of life ought you to live when it comes to or regarding holy conduct and godliness? See, he really answers it right there for us, doesn't he? He talks about living a life of holiness, right, of moral conduct, moral uprightness, of living a life in which we are doing our best to emulate God and, and to be like him as best as we possibly can. And so he says that there in, in verse 11. Verse 12, he says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and elements will melt with intense heat. Think about that. There are some people in this world who would just as soon delay the coming of, second coming of Christ. Why? Because they're not ready. But he says, as Christians, it ought not be that way for us. We ought to be living every day as though we are ready, as though we are looking, not only looking forward to God coming back, but we are hastening the day. We are trying to get him to come back as soon as possible. Maybe you've heard people make that or pray that prayer before, where they're praying for the Lord to come back to come back quickly, to come back soon, perhaps because of the state of the world that we live in or because you know, they're, they're ready to meet their Lord. They're ready to get out of, out of this world that we live in with all of its troubles and its heartaches and all of those things, and they're ready to be with the Lord for all of eternity. But notice he talks about that. What kind of person ought we to be to live our life, not just in holy conduct and in godliness, but also for, for looking forward to that day, for hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. We ought not be the kind of people who are living the kind of life where we say, I hope the Lord delays his coming a little longer because I'm not through living my life, if you know what I mean. That's not the kind of conduct that we ought to be living. Knowing that God keeps his promises, knowing that God is going to do what he says that he's going to do, and knowing that you and I do not know the exact day or hour that God is going to come and do those things, then what Peter is saying is we need to stay ready every single day. And how we do that is how we live our lives, in holy conduct, in godliness, in looking forward to the coming of the Lord, and in hastening that day along. And so as we consider these things together, not just from what we talked about this morning, but also from this afternoon, we understand that it absolutely matters how we live our life. It absolutely matters that we're trying to live our life the way that God would have us to live, that God has set forth for us a standard to live by. Now we know that we're not going to be perfect. We're going to try. 
We're going to do our best, but we know there are going to be times where we mess up, where we make those mistakes. I mentioned this morning, 1 John chapter 1, uh, really verses 5 through 10, but verses 7 through 10 we mentioned specifically this morning. And you know, I used to have it, and, and it's, it's in Bibles past, I don't have it written specifically in this one, but it's kind of ingrained in here in my mind at this point. But somewhere along the way, someone's, not me, but someone else coined this phrase, and I wrote this there beside that passage, there in 1 John chapter 1 and verses 5 through 10. And I wrote there, and this is what someone else said, and it stuck with me ever since, that that passage of Scripture there, that it's about direction, not perfection, right? And that's true. And in fact, that's something that's it's good for us to remember when it comes to the words of our Lord there, uh, that we have, uh, that, are, that are inspired through what John wrote, that it's about direction, not perfection. In other words, God knows that we're not going to be perfect, but are we heading in the right direction? Have we turned away from our Lord? Or are we continuing to head in the right direction? And so this afternoon, as you consider your life, as you consider where you are before God, again, as we ask the question this morning, we ask again now, have you put your trust and your faith in God? And if so, have you obeyed Him by becoming a child of His? If you've not this afternoon, we encourage you to think very seriously about that decision today. Maybe you already are a child of God. Maybe you've done that. But again, maybe as you think about your life, are you ready? When you ask yourself this question, and only you can answer this for yourself, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready for that day in which the Lord will come again? If He were to come again today, would you be ready? And could you say confidently this afternoon, I know that I have eternal life. If not, then that's what we're here to do today, to help you to get to that point that when you leave this place this afternoon, that you can say confidently without a shadow of doubt in your mind, I know that I have eternal life because I know what God has promised and I know what I've done according to those promises and I've put my faith in Him, I've obeyed Him, are you willing to do that today? If so, won't you come while together we stand and sing this song together? There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted by him. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming, there's a sing this song to do that. I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned
Once again, being able to be together, what a joy it is to share in each other's fellowship and this time of worship and study. Please be with us as we depart. Watch over us. Keep us safe. We pray that you bring us back at the next opportunity. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.